Pastor James and Jenny. It's good to see you here at our kitchen table with uh, a part six of our uh, video that we've been doing, a uh, Sunday school lesson, uh, Living with Hope in a Broken World. Hey, it's good to see y'all this afternoon. I'm glad that you're here. And uh, again, this is part six of a study we've been doing out of the Bible Studies for Life book. And uh, if you don't have a copy of that uh, at home, uh, we have some copies here at Old St. George Baptist Church, and we would love for you to have a copy of it uh, to follow along. Um, we'll talk at the end today about what we're going to do starting next week. And, uh, and so, but anyway, we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 5 today, 1 Peter chapter 5, and we're going to talk about the culmination of our hope. We've been talking about hope and living with hope in a broken world. Peter's writing to um, a church that's been scattered because they've been persecuted uh, for doing good because living out their faith and living for God. And, uh, and so he has been writing throughout all of 1 Peter about uh, holding on and, and so forth. And so we're going to talk about the culmination of our hope that one day there is an eternal reward uh, uh, not because we've suffered, but because we've been faithful through our suffering, okay? And uh, and, and so um, there's other videos. You can go back uh, on, on, using the same link. Go back to James A. Way Ministries, and uh, you can find the other five videos that goes along with this and, and study and look back over it. Uh, it'll be a good time to do it, okay? And so uh, Jenny's going to get us started out. There's a study. Uh, there's a there's a story in our uh, study guide that uh, that I asked her to, to share and read. Is a story about C.S. Lewis. And uh, so, um, uh, Jenny, how about take it away for us? Okay. If you have your study guide, it's going to be on page seventy three. C.S. Lewis lived through two world wars and understood all too well the tumult and grief of that season of world history. Many were suffering greatly across his homeland of Great Britain and throughout Europe and the Pacific. Additionally, Lewis mourned the death of his wife, Joy, who passed away after an illness during their brief marriage. Yet the sufferings and setbacks that dotted Lewis's life only seemed to fuel his writings. In one of his greatest accomplishments, Mere Christianity, for example, Lewis wrote, If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably earth, earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. I must keep alive in myself the desire for my true country, which I shall not find until after death. Because Christians have been given eternal life in the coming kingdom of God, we have hope. The trials of this life will one day give away to a life of eternal joy and peace. Notice something he said, if, if none of my earthly pleasures satisfy uh, that desire that's within mine, uh, then, then that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. It just simply arouses it, okay? And so, um, again, Peter was writing to a scattered church that had been scattered because of persecution simply because they was righteous, okay? They was doing godly work, and, and they were loving on their neighbors, and uh, they was faithfully serving God. And so people, uh, there was people that just persecuted them. Nero was started the persecution of Christians, and so... Peter is writing to them to stand firm in their faith and to, to, to give them uh, encouragement as they're going along, okay? And so in chapter 5, he has given them some practical advice on how to do that, okay? And so, Jenny, how about read for us verses 5 through 7, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 through 7. Young men, in the same way be submissive to those who are older. All of you, clothe yourself with humility toward one another. Because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Thank you. Okay. Now, verse 5 that actually begins with the ending from the previous section where he was talking about, um, uh, about, about uh, submission to one another and taking care of one another. And in fact, uh, he had already talked about elders um, uh, to, you know, those witnessing and, and different things like that. So he was talking about some of that. And, and, and so uh, he is telling the young men here in, in, in the congregation, he's telling the young bucks, okay, uh, to be submissive to the older men don't um, go out here and do your own thing now that word submission is a is actually was actually a military term and that, that meant to be fighting on the same team uh, properly lined up under authority 
and uh, being respectful and, uh, and and not just out there running off and doing your own thing and getting all kind of stuff. Uh, and so so he was he started there. And so in verse the last part of verse five, uh, he is telling the young bucks that that they need to be clothed with humility because um, a lot of the younger folks was, was just wanting to throw away the older folks and things like that. And it kind of sound like some of our stuff today. But anyway, that's another ball game. And uh, and so uh, so Peter's telling the young bucks that um, they, they need to be clothed with with humility. Now this is a lesson for every one of us. A young buck. Um, uh, a young doe, uh, old buck, and old doe. Okay, and uh, so you know, so he's talking to all of us. Now he uses this word. He says, "Notice what he says." He says, "I want you to be clothed with humility. Clothe yourself with humility toward one another." Now that word "clothe" was um, w- w- is an interesting term. Now, how many of you, um, when you're cooking, do you put on an apron over your other clothes? Now, I don't do that. You know, I just get stuff on my hands and wipe them off. And Jenny said, "Ah, oh, you're doing that." Uh, anyway, some of you, um, uh, some of you put on um, uh, aprons over your other clothes. Well, the term that he uses here is really putting on an apron, but it was also to distinguish or differentiate rather uh, between a slave and a free person. The slaves would put on a on a um, uh, on an apron. That way, uh, people looking around the crowd as people was mixing and mingling uh, would would say, "Hey, uh, that was a, a slave, and uh, he was not a free person." And uh, and and so so he was telling them that they they needed to do that. And uh, and 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 what he was not saying, "Hey, you've got to be a slave," but he was simply saying, "You need to be different than everybody else." And uh, and, and all. now now Paul says in First Corinthians chapter nine verse nineteen, he says, "I am not a slave. I am not owned by any man." However, he goes on then and says, I have made myself a slave to everyone in order to reach some. And, uh, and that really ought to be uh, what our, what our uh, thoughts ought to be. And, and, but, but listen, you said, what's that got to do with the thing? Peter and Paul hung out together. Yeah, and so when Peter would have been writing, clothe yourself with humility, Paul would have been writing and thinking, hey, you know, I'm not a slave to anybody, but I'm going to be a slave to everyone and uh, and everything. But Peter was just simply reminding his readers that they are to be servants of Almighty God to everyone that they would run into and meet. Uh, they would live in humility before God uh, because... Um, when when they lived in humility, it kept them from rebelling against God. And um, you know, somebody said it this way: humility will keep you from strutting before God, and it will keep you from strutting before others. Also, yeah, it would do that. So basically, Peter is telling us then to put on humility and allow God to use our sufferings uh, to deepen our commitment then to to Him. That's right. That's right. So, because one day God's going to reward our faithfulness. Then. That's right. You know, God doesn't reward us for suffering, but He does reward us for being faithful through our suffering. That that we're holding on to His mighty hand as He holds on to ours. That we're looking to Him for our comfort, our strength, our guidance, and everything. But in order to stay faithful to stay humble, uh, Peter told his uh, readers to cast all their cares on Him. That's what He uh, says in verse seven: Cast all your anxiety, cast all your cares on on God, because He cares for you. Uh, and, and it was meaning to give him responsibility, to give him the control of everything that, that's actually worrying you, actually eating your lunch. And, and uh, you know, whether you've got troubles, whether you've got worries, whether you've got anxieties and, and you're stressing out, anything that's eating your lunch, stealing your goat, whatever words you want to use that's calling turmoil in your life. Uh, he said you need to cast all of that upon God because he cares for you and he can take care of you, okay? And so let's move on to verses 8 and 9. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Okay, and so thank you. We listen. We we shouldn't grow lax in following the Lord. We we don't need to 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 to, to say well. Um, uh, it's a lot of trouble, and you know. But you know, I'd be honest with you. To, to remain faithful, it takes work. To be unfaithful, you don't have to do absolutely nothing. That's right. And so, uh, so what I wanted to do is just um, encourage you to, to not grow lax in doing good. In fact, Paul writes in Ephesians, um, he says, don't grow weary in doing good. Here, Peter is just saying, um, you, you need to be careful, okay? Uh, because when we start being lax in our fellowship with the Lord, when we start being lax in what we do, uh, then we end up underestimating the power and the fierceness of our enemy. 
whom Peter names. Peter names our enemy, and, and notice he calls him the devil. He says he is the devil. We know him as Satan, um, Beelzebub, um, uh, the, the, the wicked one, okay? And, uh, and, and so he, he describes the devil in a certain way. He says he is like a roaring lion who is prowling around looking for his next meal. He's ready to eat somebody up, and he's roaring. And the reason a lion would roar would be to paralyze his prey. And so in, in the name of Jesus, you can tell him, shut up, I don't want to listen to you. And you don't even have to listen to the roar of that lion. You do need to listen to the roar of the lion of Judah who is saying, I'm going to protect you. But the roar of the devil is to paralyze you, to eat you up, okay? And so Peter says, when you're hearing the roar of the lion, here's a couple of things you need to do. You need to stay sober. According to, I think King James says sober and vigilant. Um, here in the um, in the New International, uh, we we reading from, it says, resist him, stand firm in the faith because your brothers throughout the area. And, and also um, uh, resist him and stand firm. So, um, so sober means really to be clear-headed, okay? Keep your head about you. When the old devil is roaring because he's wanting to eat you up, Keep a clear head, okay? And don't let it get foggy there. Vigilant means to be cautious and on guard. And so, so, so what he's saying is that we're to be cautious and on guard at all times. Keep our head clear. Um, and uh, why? Because the devil's going to try to isolate you. He's going to make you think, hey, I'm the only one going through this. Um, you know, the anybody ever ever gone through the woe is me syndrome? Woe is me. Nobody, ever, nobody understands what I'm going through. I'm the only one going through this. You know, you start singing. Uh, what's that? What's that old um, uh, spiritual? Um, Nobody knows the trouble. Listen, that's a lie because um, Jesus does and, uh, and, and everything. You know, when, when, when you start doing the woe is me crying and whining, uh, what, you are, what you're going to do, you're going to actually start feeling, so to speak, and it's, I'm using figurative speech, okay? You're going to actually, it's kind of like feeling the fangs of the, of the devil then biting into you because he's getting you, okay? And but in the name of Jesus, one fail one one small word, the name Jesus can actually just get rid of him. That's why he says that's why he says to um uh, to resist him, okay? Uh, look at verse nine one more time. Notice what verse nine says again. It says, resist the devil, stand firm in in your in the faith. Now that means your faith, the faith that you have in Jesus Christ, okay? Because um because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings, okay? And so what he's saying is you're not alone. He, remember, Peter's writing to a group of, a, a church body that has been scattered. He said, listen, you're not the only one over there that the devil's roaring at. Uh, you got brothers and sisters who spread throughout the whole world that's going through some of this kind of stuff. And so um, you're not the only one going through this. If you would do a quick search on the internet um, uh, looking for persecuted Christians, you can find a lot of stuff. You can go to Voice of the Martyrs, uh, other places like that. And, uh, and, and, and so there are other people that around the world have been persecuted because of being a Christian uh, all around the world. And they're being persecuted on a daily basis, okay? Many are denied food, many are denied in education, uh, health care, interactions with their family, uh, jobs, and simply because they are obedient uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, on page um, uh, 76 of our student guide um, here, uh, they give a couple of um, um, uh, statistics here that I want you to hear. It's startling statistics, okay? It says every month on average, okay, this is a if this was an average month, every month on the average, 359 Christians are killed because of their faith. 154 churches and Christian buildings are burned or attacked. Um, Hindus are doing that. Uh, Muslims are doing that. Um, the Chinese government is doing that with uh, Christian churches even today. 262 Christians are detained without trial, arrested, sentenced, and imprisoned. Uh, that's just some s small statistics going on uh, around the world. And so if, oh, if you have your book, you look on page 77, there is a prayer guide that you way that you can help pray for our brothers and sisters around the world. Uh, they have uh, a list of things that you can pray about. Uh, some of them are you're praying for wisdom for the church that's being persecuted, okay? And uh, you can pray for boldness for Christians who are persecuted for their faith. Uh, you can pray for secret house churches that are meeting daily throughout the world. So there's just a lot of different things. Like I said, it's a big list. Uh, go look at it on page 77 and, and pray for these 
folks because they're all over the world and they're all suffering in uh, different ways and uh, really that we have no idea. I mean, we hear about it, but we've never experienced it, so we, we really don't know. We can't understand. But please, uh, you know, pray for them. That's right, because, you know, there are brothers and sisters around the world. They're going through stuff that we're not going through. Listen, the, word, the key word here is yet. Right. We're not going through this yet. One day we will. As, as, as we continue uh, going more and more godless in this country, um, some of the things that our brothers and sisters around the world, uh, we're going to start facing, okay? And, uh, and so, we don't, now listen, if you don't have this book, you need, to, you need to see me Sunday at church, see Jenny at church, see one of the deacons at church, say, okay, I need one of those books that James and Jenny's teaching from, and uh, you can get one, uh, they, they're free, and we still have copies left, and uh, uh, they said, which one? It is the one that Frank's Sunday school class is using, okay? And there's still books there, and uh, and they do, they don't do us any good sitting on the table collecting dust. They do good when you're at home when you're reading it, okay, and using it, okay. And so uh, make sure you get one, okay. Now uh, let's move on because we need we need to move on, okay. How about uh, Jenny? How about read for us verses ten and eleven? And the God of all grace, who called you to His eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will Himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And uh, listen, uh, Paul, uh, not Paul, but Peter is giving us four things right here that he tells us that will um, uh, help us to understand about our hope in Christ and what's going to happen uh, at, toward the end of our time or after we pass and the, the reward of faithfulness, okay? Um, it's, notice what he says. He says, it will make uh, you perfect, okay? And it says, all God of all grace who called you to eternal glory, if you suffer, will allow him to will, will restore you and make you strong and firm and steadfast. And so uh, he, he says he's going to make you make you perfect, okay? Now you say, oh, that's great, you know? And, and it is. Now, that word perfect means that he's going to mend us. Uh, he's going to make us whole. He's going to repair us. He's going to put us back together. Remember, Jesus said the Spirit of God was upon him uh, to, to uh, lift up the broken, bind up the broken heart and lift up the wounded. And, and, and that's what uh, Peter is getting at here, and that we're to do that. Um, the word that he uses here really means it's like, because uh, Peter, remember, Peter was a fisherman. It was like repairing a torn net. And that's what God's going to do in your life. He's going to put it back together. Um, like re restoring a broken bone. Anybody ever had a broke bone? And, uh, and what they do, they go in and set it by putting it back in place. And that's the word he's using there. You know, the, the, the broke bone, I've had a broke bone. I've had a broke leg and a broke arm and, uh, before. And uh, listen, uh, that, that's painful. But when they reset it, the pain starts going away. And, uh, and so God, God is going to reset your bones, so to speak. He's going to mend you, make you perfect. He's going to use it greatly. Then he says he's going to establish you. Now, this is King James language, establish you, okay? And uh, that means he's going to put you on a firm foundation. He's going to ground you and put you on a firm foundation so you can stand strong. Then he says he's going to strengthen you, okay? And um, um, that and that just that just just what it means, okay? He's gonna he's just gonna strengthen you. Um, Isaiah forty one verse ten, uh, uh, God says, "Don't be afraid, because I'm with you. Uh, no matter what you're going through, don't be afraid. God's with you." Then he goes on. He says, "And don't be discouraged." Now, how many of in, 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 any anybody want to raise their hand, give a testimony? Let me get my hand going. Uh, anybody got a testimony? You know, I, I had a pity party before. Anybody? Jenny, you ever had a pity party? Yeah. Well, I mean, what you doing at a pity party? I have the, all the time. <laughs> the Bible says, "Don't be discouraged." And he don't have a pity party, okay? And he said, "He says, here's why: for I am your God." I like that. Now you might want to write down Isaiah forty-one ten and go back and look at this. God says, "Don't be afraid. I am with you." Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, and I will help you, and I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. Man, that's a great promise. That's a great promise. Man, I, uh, you know, we're going to, about like having church here today. Okay, hallelujah. Okay, then there's one other that he says. He says um, that he will settle you, okay? Uh, that word settle, remember the Bible, and Peter's already used this, that Jesus is that foundation. He's that, he's that foundation stone. He's that cornerstone, that capstone. as the arch was coming together. It was put right in there and, and kept everything there. He was that cornerstone. And, uh, and, and what he is saying is that Jesus is that cornerstone. He's the solid rock of our foundation, and we stand on that, and we are settled. Uh, remember Jesus said it this way. 
when you, you have a choice, you can either build your house on, on sand or rock, and when the storms of life come, what's going to happen? And he said, when we follow him, it's like building a house on a rock. Uh, didn't mean the storms weren't going to come because he had a storm that came. Uh, it just means you're not going to uh, be blown every which way and all the way around like that. And so what he's saying is uh, that, that even though you're going to be running through storms, uh, you've got something to anchor on. And, and, and so Peter's using these four terms, and uh, he's reminding us that God will strengthen the Christian, but you've got to stay faithful. He will enable the Christian to endure the suffering, but you've got to stay faithful. And as he's doing that, he will safely bring you through all the trials to eternal life. Again, you're not getting eternal life and a reward for, being, for, for suffering, but you will get a reward for being faithful through the suffering. I can't emphasize that enough. You're not being rewarded for being suffering. I hear people say, well, I know there's going to be heaven. God's got a place in heaven for me because, man, I've been suffering on this earth. been going through hell on earth. That's not why you get into heaven. You get into heaven simply because you made a personal conscious decision Sorry. to confess your sin, repent of your sin, trust Jesus Christ to do exactly what he says he would do because he died on the cross for you. That's how you get into heaven, not because you suffered on this earth. And, uh, and so, um, and so uh, but you do get a reward for being faithful through your suffering, okay? And so, uh, Jenny, read for us verse 11 because, listen, I want you to listen to this very carefully because this needs to become our prayer. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. That should be our prayer. To God be the power forever and ever. We don't have any power. We have Holy Ghost power that lives within us, but the power is not ours. We just a conduit through which it works. And for us to stay faithful and remain strong so that we can be made strong and be restored. And uh, even when we are suffered, be firm and, and steadfast, okay? And so, um, and so what he is simply saying here in that verse 11, uh, to him be power forever and forever, amen, is that God is sovereign. He rules. He reigns supreme, okay? It also saying that he is omnipotent. Now, that's one of the three omni words. Omnipotent meaning that he is all-powerful. He can do everything, and he has power to do anything. Nothing is impossible with God. Right. And, uh, and so, he could, listen, God could stop the storm of suffering that you, that you are going through. Or he can let it run its course to stretch you and to strain you as you grow more and more like Jesus Christ. And that's what God wants to do. He allows storms and trials and sufferings to come into our life to strengthen us, um, not to say, okay, wonder, wonder if James or Jenny has enough faith to get. No, he knows whether we do or not, but he shows us where we're at with our faith, where we're weak, and so he can say, I, I want to strengthen you here. You've got to shore this up. You know, if I go over to a table or a chair and I shake it and it's, um, and it's wild, then, then I know, okay, there's got to be something to be strengthened here. And that's what God does using storms and sufferings in our life. And so, uh, so he can um, help us with, uh, with that, okay? And also, someone wrote, With a view to eternity, any suffering we experience is short and has an end. It will not last forever, and it will not overshadow the whole of our lives with Christ. I like that. Uh, notice what she said. With a view of eternity, our suffering we experience is shortly a while. Because it's, can I take a pen and do it this way? Here's my pen. It's just a dot in the whole timeline. Just a point, okay? And, uh, and so, um, so don't let it overshadow your life with Jesus Christ. And uh, yeah, nobody likes suffering. Nobody, you know, we, we don't like that. But we do like the pity parties. Um, but, um, but, but God uh, is faithful and he'll walk with you through that and he will comfort you and help you through that so you can help others, okay? So let's kind of summarize the lesson, okay? And I'm going to give you three words. Write, pray, pray. Let me say that again. Write, now this is W-R-I-T-E, like you're writing something, okay? Write, pray, pray, okay? Oh, I thought you was going to ask me something. Oh, Okay. Okay, so I thought you was going to ask me, what does I mean by right? Okay, and so here we go. That's okay. And uh, normally you do. And so but anyway, so here's what right is. Uh, over the last five weeks, six weeks now, we've been talking about, um, about, um, about, about, about living with hope in a broken world. So go back over to six weeks and, uh, and just write down some things that you've learned, okay? And uh, what have you discovered and, and what's impact on you? Because there's just something about writing it down. Some of you like to journal. Go ahead and do that and just write that down, okay? 
So what do you mean by to pray? Yay, she's got this. She caught on. Yay. What do I mean by pray? Um, you can write out uh, the, what we've been looking here in First Peter chapter 5, verse 11, and, and kind of use it as your prayer guide. Um, you know, use it like this, you know. Uh, I will clothe myself with humility toward others. Because God approaches the proud and gives grace to the humble. I will humble myself under God's mighty hand that he may lift me up in my time of trouble. I will cast all my anxiety on him because he is caring for me. I will be self-controlled and I will be alert because my enemy, the devil, is purring around like a roaring lion and he's looking to devour me and he's not going to eat me up. I will resist the devil. I will stand firm in the faith. I will I will do this because my brothers and sisters throughout the world are going to the same kind of sufferings and I'm going to stand strong with them and, and so forth. Okay, And you can do that and just write that out. You know, verse 10, the God of all grace who has called me to eternal glory in Christ Jesus. After I have suffered a little while, he himself will restore me. He will make me strong. He will make me firm. He will make me steadfast. And I'm going to praise him and give him all the power and glory forever and ever. Amen. And you can just kind of make that your um, your, your kind of day life. Okay? So write, pray, pray. Okay? So the other pray, she didn't ask me. <laughs> you know, I don't know you gave me that. Okay. So she didn't ask me. Okay. James, what do you mean by the second prayer? You see what I got to put. This is my <laughs> suffering, people. Okay. Um, what I mean, so, so I got a second prayer here, okay? The first one is pray, you know, pray this and make that your prayer. You know, cast all your cares on him. The second prayer is pray together. Get with some fellow believers, okay? And talk with them about um, uh, about about some things that you're going through. And, and pray for the persecuted church and uh, that's around the world. Now, if you're going, well, I don't know what going on around the world, uh, internet search, you can do it. You call me, call Jenny. We have resources we can tell you about and uh, you can you can look at and, and, and use and uh, that way you can pray uh, for the persecuted church around the world because we got brothers and sisters being around there, okay? Mm -hmm. And so um, anyway, again, uh, this uh, in, in this in, in our student guide, uh, in, in the pages we're looking at for this week, they give several resources and uh, that you can look online, look at other places or call for and uh, and get some help with. Okay, uh, that, that deals with that. So next week, because uh, we've done with this um, the study. Okay, next week on page um, something here. Um, what page is that on? It's on page, uh, starting on page 85. Um, it's just a special focus study on here, and it's how should I respond to politics, and uh, it's Romans chapter uh, 13. And so we're going to do that, and uh, and, and then, uh, and, and, and so, you know, it's kind of like a timely message because we're in a political year and everything. Then after that, the week after that, we're going to begin, um, I think it's about a five-week, six-week study, and um, um, six-week study, uh, and it's called, Why Do I Need the Church? You know, during this time of the COVID-19 and being scattered, um, that is a great question. Why do we need the church? People asking that. Uh, people have de church meaning, hey, I grew up in church. I'm no longer going. Used to go for a while. I'm no longer going anymore. And uh, the people that de church we have people who are unchurched who've never been. And uh, and so, and, and, and both groups are asking, why do I need the church? Sometimes people who are faithfully going have, well, why do I need the church? Why do I need to come? That, that, and so this is going to be a great study, okay? And so uh, look, we're looking forward to teaching that uh, on the next Again, uh, that's going to be in this same book, okay? And so if you don't have one, get one and follow along, okay? And so we're done. Anything you want to say and wrap up? No, that's good. Okay. So why don't you lead us in prayer? Okay. okay. <laughs> Father, we thank you for this day and this time together. And Father, we ask that you be with each one who is watching and listening, Father. And Father, just speak to their hearts and continue to draw us to you, Father. And, and Father, just show us ways that we can minister to the, the church around us, Father, and to the uh, church that's being persecuted, Father. And Father, just help us to lift them up in prayer, Father, and just uh, show us ways, Father, that we can minister to them. And Father, we ask that you'll be with us today, Father. Lead us and guide us and fill us with your wisdom, Father. And Father, just open up opportunities for us to serve you. We ask this in your holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us and uh, uh, rejoicing your suffering, okay? Love you.